is this wonderful bagpiper and researcher in, in, uh, in Austria called uh, Michael or Michael Vereno. I don't know how to uh, pronounce it perfectly. And you know, it's one of those fellows that you meet online. Um, so I was doing my, my research on the Finnish Sakipelli and I received uh, an email and the mail said, Dear Gonzalo, I'm a professor at, at Vienna and Michael Vereno told me that I must speak to you. And his name was uh, Ulrich Morgenstern. Can you? Thank you very much, dear Gonzalo, for this nice introduction. I really warmly want to thank uh, our host uh, for the possibility uh, to be here uh, with you. It's the uh, second time. Uh, the first time I am Helsinki, except uh, the way from the port to the highway to Leningrad, Petersburg, and back. <laughs> I've been in Tampere uh, some 15 years ago, and I was really impressed by the generous invitation comparing with the significance of folk music in my home country, uh, Germany. So I'm very happy to be here uh, again. The topic of my, where we are, we are here. Oh, the fourth one? Uh, oh, the, uh, oh yes, with my name, uh, I guess. Can you see it? No. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, we are a bit uh, back. So, uh, I have two topics uh, today. By the way, I have to apologize. The PowerPoint is a bit uh, pure. Uh, I could uh, make it more in a better design, uh, considering the theoretical and aesthetical dimensions of this term uh, in our meeting. But uh, you may understand, I have many colleagues in uh, Russian and um, in Ukraine. Both uh, of them uh, needed uh, immediate moral support and uh, contact, and uh, it was hard for me to return in this wonderful piping world. Uh, so, uh, I have two topics. Uh, the first is uh, Russian uh, reed pipes in museums, in organology and in public uh, discourses. Only a very short and superficial uh, introduction to traditional uh, reed pipes in, uh, in Russian. Uh, and then I will uh, switch to the bagpipes and some uh, very rough uh, observations of the disseminations of the uh, typological uh, morphology uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, including uh, the Baltic uh, countries. Because this is important for uh, general um, issues. And as Barnaby Brown uh, said, uh, it is far unhelpful uh, to operate with national uh, borders. This is a fact that the uh, piping world, uh, Croatian, Hungarian uh, piper and pipe maker, maker Andor Wake told me long ago. Uh, he uh, said it's, it's totally it's impossible in the in the Carpathian Basin uh, to sort uh, the, uh, the bagpipe types according to ethnic uh, borders. It, uh, it doesn't work. It can work in some way uh, concerning the music. This is uh, even very likely, uh, but uh, not the typology of the, um, of the instruments. So, we have in general in Russian single reed pipes, double reed pipes and horn pipes, bagpipes, single and the asterisk, uh, this is not postmodernist German uh, orthography, it means the double chanter as a linguistic uh, uh, can be uh, reconstructed. Uh, 
but now we have even found a triple chanter bagpipe uh, in Novgorod. But uh, this is far from the living traditions uh, from the 14th century you probably have heard um, uh, about. This is a very interesting history, the drone-less double and even triple chanter bagpipes. This would be another topic with, which would take uh, too much uh, time. So, single reed pipes. You see this? Uh, it is called uh, uh, the bark horn. Uh, it has different names, of course, in tradition and uh, scholarship. It is a single uh, reed pipe with uh, two or three uh, finger holes. Uh, it is made in a technique very interesting. Maybe you had it in Finland as well. Uh, you turn out uh, from a, a solid piece of wood uh, the middle. Uh, it's very different to do this. Uh, and I met only one uh, old uh, former shepherd during my old field work who was able to do this. Uh, so uh, this is one type uh, of a single reed pipe with a great, uh, sometimes much longer um, bark uh, bell, but we also have the other one. This is basically playing for cows. It's shepherd music. The shepherd wouldn't play this instrument, uh, instrument to entertain himself, which, as we have heard yesterday, he would play it in the morning uh, to wake up uh, the, the people that they will chase out the cows uh, to gather the um, herd. Uh, you know all this and many things uh, I uh, can could talk about these instruments are very, very, very similar to the Finnish uh, tradition. And by the way, this type of instrument, you find it in north east, uh, in northwest Russian, in the Pskov, uh, Novgorod, Vologda region. But in the Smolensk region, where the Finno-Ugrian hydronomy uh, comes to an end, this instrument immediately disappeared. So sometimes ethnic borders are really interesting, but much more for this more uh, archaic uh, instruments. Not for the instruments uh, for, for dancing. And this hunter's uh, signal instruments as well. By the way, in the 80s there was a very, interest, a very great interest uh, of my let's say, uh, more liberal uh, colleagues uh, in, in Russian to Finno-Ugrian uh, substrate. This was a uh, Aesopian language uh, to fight uh, Russian chauvinism, to uh, emphasize uh, the, uh, the role of Finno-Ugrian so, uh, prehistory uh, for uh, the Russian traditional culture. But, uh, well, this was in the 80s. Uh, These voices are not so loud uh, today. So, uh, yes, in the book it is called, uh, it is called uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the Music Device of the Russian uh, Shepherd, but in case, well, uh, it's an inter-ethnic uh, issue. So, next is, sorry, uh, Single reed pipes played for humans. Uh, this is in the 50s or 60s, uh, an ensemble from the South Russian court, uh, Kursk region, and the man at the left, he played this hornpipe. It is also uh, played by uh, Sergei Starostin, he, who did field work, extensive field work in the Tver uh, region. He has a very, very interesting hornpipe, and the holes are so sharply uh, made that he can took out the reed and uh, play it like a flute. At least some sound uh, is, is very interesting. I've never heard about such an instrument. Um, so he uh, learned it uh, from the old shepherd in the uh, 80s, and now it's a great uh, revival of this uh, single uh, hornpipe, uh, also as an ensemble instrument. Uh, this was a common tradition uh, among the shepherds. One of the very few uh, tunes played for humans at uh, such an instrument was recorded in the 60s in the Novgorod region by the Petersburg Phonogram Archive. Uh, let us listen to one example.
I'm sure uh, some of you uh, uh, know the Ripatska by Kantele player Fedya Hapo. The Ripatska means uh, the Russian tune. Uh, and uh, this is typical Russian male uh, step dance. Uh, it could be performed easily by only one uh, single uh, reed pipe uh, or flute. Uh, uh, it is quite uh, quite close to Fedya Hapos melody, the famous legendary uh, Karelian Kantele player. So, uh, next. Mm -hmm. Like to go on. I cannot. Uh, double reed pipes. Here uh, is a very pure uh, photo from the uh, uh, from the Glinka uh, Museum in. Oh, thank you. Hold it here. In Saint, uh, in in Moscow. Uh, this is South South Russian uh, double reed pipe. And uh, these uh, instruments uh, were famous uh, in South Russian, in the Belgorod region, very near to the Ukrainian border, and um, also in the central Volga, uh, uh, Basin, central uh, Russian. But also, as it turned out quite late, uh, in the region of Pskov. Oh, yeah, here, this is a very interesting a double reed pipe. Um, with two separate, uh, uh, two separate uh, chanter and a conical uh, bore, very sophisticated instrument uh, from the Oka uh, region. There's one paper uh, by Vasily uh, from the 80s uh, by Alek, um, Alek Vasilyevich. Uh, oh my God, uh, I will then. Uh, uh, you can find it in, uh, in my book. Um, Vasilevich, and another is Vyacheslav Shurov, uh, who studied the uh, double reed pipe uh, in the Belgorod uh, region. But then it turned out we find it. Oh yes, it's, uh, sorry, it's not right. we find it also. Ah yes, here this are uh, the original uh, in the museum. Uh, the double reed pipes are fragments of this double reed pipes from the Belgorod uh, region. And one of the last pipes I would like to show you, unfortunately the video uh, didn't work. I will send you the uh, link. This is uh, yeah, the last piper when he was about 18 years, he was interested in things like this. He didn't grow up with these traditions, but he could work with two, three uh, of the old pipers. What is interesting, he uh, didn't take a cow horn because uh, agriculture uh, went down and uh, there were no cows, uh, uh, very few in this region. It was very hard to find a cow horn, can you imagine? Uh, and so he took uh, some plastic uh, ribbon and then uh, with a color spray he fixed it. And how he got this idea from Sergei Starostin, who has documented uh, also uh, reed pipes uh, for Playing, uh, it's, uh, playing for humans, that means, oh, sorry, I forgot to say, four or five uh, finger holes, six is an exception, um, and for the cattle, two, three uh, finger holes. Uh, so he, uh, he learned that in other parts of the Russian, they use uh, birch bark or other bark, uh, and, uh, well, instrument makers are pr more practical uh, than traditionalist uh, folk music lovers. <laughs> so he, <laughs> as you all know, <laughs> and uh, so he, he made this, uh, uh, um, uh, this looks like plastic, uh, uh, this modern um, bell. So, uh, so this is the last in the Belgorod region, region and the last uh, known uh, double um, hornpiper in the Pskov region uh, was Alexander Sokolov, born in 90, uh, 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 the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, it was published in a master the a diploma thesis um, in Moscow in 75. I couldn't find the author, unfortunately. I got this thesis, at least uh, they made copies of the chapter of the double home pipe. He didn't know what he has in his hand. Uh, 
And where the instrument is, I have never seen in any museum in the Pskov region uh, such an instrument. Unfortunately, during my field work, I didn't even know. I was asking about bagpipes, but not about double uh, chanter, um, uh, double horn pipes. So let's listen to one. Следующую uh, сыграем акустическую задорную. This idea of two pipes, uh, six plus three or five plus two or six plus two um, uh, finger holes, is so widespread uh, in the piping world. Take the Janoshida pipe from the Avars uh, in contemporary uh, Hungary uh, in the Volga region. Uh, so this paradigm uh, is very, very, very uh, widespread. Christian Arendt uh, tried to find a connection with the ancient Aulas, but I think it's totally different uh, playing uh, uh, technique. And But the common thing with the Aulas is you cannot do anything but multi-part music uh, with this instrument. So, and uh, this solved the mystery uh, of the um, button accordion music in this very Pskov region. They only have three, three basic chord, uh, um, chord, uh, chords, uh, G and C major and A uh, minor, and a uh, great deal of the old time music is based on this. <laughs> Russian researchers try to figure out a connection with the Gusli, with this binary harmony, G, A, G, A, is, is very natural. Yes, maybe, but uh, if compare uh, the accordion tunes and uh, the uh, tunes of the Trastianki or Double Jaleka, uh, different uh, names, uh, you will learn that uh, accordion players prefer such ornamentations uh, for which you just have to uh, shift the index finger. Oh, sorry, it's from South Russian. Well, things like this. So the secret of this accordion music is solved um, by the double clarinet. I uh, wrote about this um, long ago uh, in English. So let's now turn uh, to the bagpipes in Eastern Europe and the Balkan region. Uh, well, problematic notion of the national instruments. I think this issue is already outdated because it is so clear overemphasis of ethnic factors in the history of folk musical instruments, ethno-political ambitions, of course. Uh, this is an old story. So, let's go to the evidence. The first type uh, of um, uh, Lithuanian Belarusian bagpipes, uh, they have curved bellies, metal incrustations, and stitched backs. Very, very uh, seldom uh, they have you find uh, gold bags. Uh, maybe there's only one in, uh, one information of the gold bag. So this is a more modern variant, stitched uh, bag. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, in bagpipe revivals, uh, they all uh, like goats uh, very much. And one uh, Belarusian hobby researcher, they made a very professionally made film about the ancient, uh, the musical instruments of the ancient Belarusian civilization. And he says, well, the uh, domestication of the goat in Belarus was 6,000 years ago, so that was the time the deck bagpipe was invented. So then I, I wrote in Russian an article um, about, uh, with the subtitle, <laughs> Sometimes the goat is only a goat. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, these are one of the last uh, pipers uh, we know. We have uh, recordings from the Pushkin house from one piper who, who was born in 1838, can you imagine? In, in 1931, he was uh, uh, recorded by Evgeny Gipius. These are closed uh, um, recordings. But I can show uh, uh, some other from the 30s, uh, one historical recording of this last generation of pre revival pipers. <laughs> is the lower fourth uh, and uh, the tonic uh, you have here, the principle of the uh, Polish uh, Bock. Very similar, only uh, it is uh, in Mayana. So there are a lot of nationalist legends uh, already said. Uh, this uh, Swedish uh, shepherd mentioned by Olaus Magnus in uh, 5055 is uh, considered to be a Belarusian uh, Spielmann of Skamaroch. Uh, in fact, uh, Belarusian, uh, he was in Belarusian or Lithuanian uh, at the time and uh, um, wrote also about bagpipes, but uh, this has nothing to do with this uh, picture. And it's a typical medieval uh, bagpipe. There's an idea, uh, five or one? Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> There's an idea by Ralf Gehler, um, one of the leading specialists in Germany for uh, folk musical instruments and particularly historical and social history of musical instruments uh, in the German Baltic Sea region, but not only in the German. He worked with the Rostock pipe, which will be very interesting in uh, our context. He, uh, his position is that at some time in the Middle Ages, uh, bagpipes were very, very similar uh, everywhere, and then the uh, division uh, took part, differentiation. Okay, next uh, type B, chanter and drones without the belly. I think I should not talk too much about the Estonian uh, bagpipes here, uh, you see it. Uh, you find the type B also in Belarus, this Duda Matsyanka. Uh, uh, this is early 20th century. Uh, it was played in the Lutinsky region um, of uh, Latvia, but most Belarusian colleagues say it's a Belarusian instrument, but uh, in fact uh, this is a Latgal uh, region. This is not the Slavic uh, Orthodox uh, population probably. And uh, as Ernst Eugen Schmidt from Cologne, a private researcher with an enormous uh, archive and knowledge, he, uh, he encouraged to study this instrument in the context of the many, many other triple chanter uh, instruments we uh, find in Central uh, Europe. Similar instrument without the cohorn uh, uh, we find uh, in uh, Latvia. This has already been the topic. One very interesting evidence from the northern uh, Ukraine. Uh, there's no studies, only this uh, poor photo of the Atlas of Musical Instruments of the Soviet Union. I could never work with this um, uh, instruments. Uh, it is in Petersburg uh, in the uh, uh, music and theater museum, uh, the great collection of musical instruments in, uh, in St. Petersburg. I hope that the Russian colleagues or whoever would uh, study these instruments. Uh, it reminds uh, in some way uh, the uh, sack pipa. Uh, probably it doesn't have a thumb hole. We don't know. Uh, and in Moldavia, we have uh, quite similar uh, instruments and also in the eastern part of uh, Romania. What is interesting, uh, in Romania, the tonic uh, will be at the lowest note or the second lowest uh, note. Uh, and in Belarus, and probably also in Russian, uh, we had, uh, we had uh, 
tonic here uh, and the continuous interaction with the lower fourth, which is very important for playing staccato uh, at the level of the tonic. You uh, will, uh, you know what I mean. Uh, so now, chanta and drones without a belly, also in Russian. It's a very pure iconographical sources, but we can make sense of this. And this is uh, Matthew Guthrie uh, from Edinburgh, who wrote uh, uh, um, uh, Russian ethnography in 1795, uh, and he uh, described this, as he said, uh, Finnish uh, bagpiper, probably he meant the uh, Estonian. Um, uh, this is a uh, quite interesting <laughs> instrument. And he describes this, I cannot say uh, that it doesn't sound sweeter than it smells, <laughs> go back. <laughs> so, he was really a great uh, ethnographer with a certain bias because uh, at that time um, it was an official policy, uh, cultural policy to find the ancient Greek roots of Russian culture. This had, of course, to do with uh, uh, the political ambitions of Catherine the Great in the conflict with the Ottoman Empire. So, in the third Rome, uh, if you know this context. So, it's also a very interesting uh, instrument, the drone fiddle, uh, the gudok, which had nothing to do with the Byzantine lyre. They have escaped the Novgorod. Everybody calls it the gudok. The name gudok came centuries later, and the instrument is totally different. So here, another piper, oh sorry, it's a bit dark, uh, from early 19th century, uh, two cow horns, one cow horns, double drone. And these two instruments uh, from the Smolensk and the uh, Ariel regions have been written down by one a pipe maker in Moscow who made absolutely uh, incredible, fantastic in <laughs> bagpipes, uh, so with had nothing to do with any uh, historical sources pure fantasy, but he is an instrument maker and he saw these instruments. And in the 70s, uh, there was uh, Ivan Czarvinsky, he worked at the television and he played uh, the bagpipes. Then unfortunately he, he sold them and nobody knows where they are. And nobody knows where the recordings are from the television. Uh, this is the last, would be the last uh, real evidence of bagpipe in Russian. And it's very different in some, yes, quite different from the uh, Belarusian one. Uh, I guess without metal incrustations, cow horns, not the wooden horns uh, as the Belarusian. It's much more simple and much closer uh, to the shepherd uh, tradition, obviously. Uh, so, of course, there is one important. Um, Northern Western European influence, Zegpi, Patoropil, and the uh, German uh, bagpipes. Uh, but here, uh, the Russian shepherd tradition comes um, uh, into play uh, as well. So, uh, type C, chanter, sometimes drone with a cow horn, also uh, in Latvia. Here uh, you can see uh, the horn has been lost, but uh, it had to be uh, attached. So in Latvia, this is very interesting. We have horns with uh, instruments, with cow horns and without. And the same in Russian. Type D, droneless bagpipes, primitive bagpipes, after veins, double chanter, natural bag. We have it in the Volga region among the Chubash, uh, the Mari, very highly developed in the Caucasus. And in Turkey, only in the, uh, the Lars and Hemshin, who are historically related to the Georgian, uh, Georgians and the uh, Armenians, and in the Greek islands. There's one specific type of these instruments, uh, which nearly exclusively uh, you can find uh, among Orthodox or former Orthodox people and the Armenians. So this opens the questions about the bagpipe in Byzantium. Uh, there are very few sources, but uh, there are. Uh, and uh, it is again very important, um, the time of the Christian uh, Middle Ages and um, where bagpipes were developing. 
Uh, there are so many paganophilia in the discourse about uh, the bagpipes. They tried to find bagpipes in ancient Greece desperately for years. There's no evidence, sorry. Maybe some Iranian uh, evidence under Weg told me, so it's absolutely open discussion. Uh, so, again, it's not about um, ethnic borders, but the orthodox religion may play some mysterious role, but musical, uh, well, musical instruments are not very well accepted by the orthodox, uh, in the orthodox world, but of course they have been played. So, uh, if we uh, compare the morphological topology and ethnicity, we see very clearly uh, that uh, it doesn't uh, correspond one uh, uh, to another. But I'm quite optimistic uh, that <laughs> it may sound strange in our days uh, that uh, in the bagpipe uh, communities uh, the national isolation, uh, isolationism, as uh, Barnaby uh, put it, uh, is on decline. Because we have YouTube, we have Facebook, and uh, it is very, I always say, but I'm studying Russian folk musical instruments for, uh, since, my God, 80-something. Uh, uh, I don't know a single Russian folk musical instrument. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ulrich. I wonder if there is, an, if there is any question in the audience or at home, or if I go ahead and ask my own. And one illustration uh, about what the magnificent backpipe revival in Russian uh, they do. It is a free uh, uh, reconstruction, but uh, it is really uh, great to see how many efforts, how many international cooperation uh, you will uh, find uh, in, in so many countries. So this is and and, and we, will, we will all together be part of that. Yeah. And thanks to Michael Vereno, yes. <laughs> who made this instrument for me. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so my question, uh, all of these topics I, will, I, I, I think will um, be connected during the afternoon. But one of those topics that I wanted to ask is that you gave the example of an accordion tune that somewhat, somehow can be correlated to a pipe tune, potentially uh, uh, earlier. Yep. <clears throat> so, on our piping conversations while drinking, uh, the joke is that the, the accordion destroyed bagpipes. So the accordion, the accordion when the accordion came, yeah. as a new trendy invention, yeah. it just squashed bagpipes. Absolutely. Okay, so it's not it's it's a consensus, uh, but on the on the same um, at the same time, it can still give us apparently from the repertoire it can give us um, information when we lack the instrument, and that's one of the things we are facing here in in Finland because we don't have the actual yeah. instrument. Can we, uh, with the help of folk musicians in other instruments? and through their repertoire. Can we make any kind of inference to the a potential bagpipe uh, repertoire? It is possible. Uh, if you make an unbiased analysis uh, of tunes, you can describe to a certain age, to a certain style, strata. Uh, uh, I think the uh, chance uh, is, is, not, uh, is not so bad. Well, uh, no, of the, no one of all these button accordion players, or maybe two or three, has even heard about a bagpipe. But in North Russian, uh, there uh, is one very early type of uh, the accordion that is called Valinka, bagpipe. And so, uh, yes, it is both about the double hornpipe, but also about the bagpipe that uh, not only drone, there's a fantastic uh, button accordion tunes with extensive uh, drone, but also the melodics. And then uh, very often the accordion player in Pskov Novgorod region, before starting the very tune, they would play 
and then starts. But only, not when he plays the waltz or the polka, but only uh, to the uh, old time music, which can be quite clearly uh, separated. So they started with this uh, introduction or between uh, sections, different sections of the tune, they uh, use this uh, uh, initial uh, motive, the visit car, business, uh, business card of the uh, bagpiper, as um, Felix Hörburger uh, put it, because it's, because it's very individual. Uh, so it's melodic as well and ornamentic. Um, the ornament and what is also very, very important. We have the double hornpipe with this binary harmony, which is very, very interesting topic, also with the, in connection with the lyre tradition. But we also um, have this style of somebody sometimes called repetitive forms, cyclist forms, parataxis, the Greek researcher have this complex, or uh, uh, Christian Verleino modularity. When very, very short units are repeated continuously or, or sh very short two motives uh, combined, micro variation and motive centricity, uh, that's, uh, that's the term I uh, prefer, um, this is a great issue, but we have, don't have any comparative research. We have research from Norwegian, from uh, Turkish Black Sea region, uh, Greek islands, um, and some more uh, traditions, but uh, we really should uh, put this uh, together and maybe meet in November this year, by the way, <laughs> okay. in Vienna. <laughs> One more question. <coughs> In, in Pibroch, both for the tumble-down business card um, um, with which every Pibroch would begin and often uh, um, sort of is the fanfare for new phrases or new movements, a very similar thing called a cadence or a cadence. Yeah. Um, and, and also in the what you prefer to call motivic centricity, um, all the repetition of, of, of small motifs. So I look forward to further conversations on, on that. And it would be amazing to see whether there is, in fact, there are patterns, geometric, whether it's reciprocity, yeah. um, particularly with, um, you know, just thinking in the visual arts of, of, of geometry, uh, and, you know, geometric art, yeah. um, this obsession with patterns. And when you have um, a limited tonal palette, how um, there is a preoccupation with, with simple, um, often binary um, um, opposition between elements. Um, so I'm most curious to know whether there are any patterns um, in your material uh, that have those qualities of reciprocity. This is now a great topic also on music theory, Michael Tenzer, Michael Tenzer uh, and, and um, music psychology, Elizabeth Margulis. I'm only starting to uh, uh, to, to read all this, uh, but it's a great topic in folk music research and musicology. So I really would like to invite you to think about this. We will. We couldn't speak yesterday. We will continue today. Okay. Thank you again.